Right, welcome to this mini seminar on uh, research and uh, specifically on how to make a strong thesis. So whether you're doing a master thesis, bachelor thesis, uh, you know, a PhD thesis, there are some things that are really easy to miss or easy to do that if you don't do them, you will have a very weak thesis and you'll have problems um, trying to make, make the whole thing stand behind good conclusions and, and the right uh, findings. In research, we're usually starting in the model world, or at least we pretend we start here in the world of uh, abstract knowledge, description about reality that are capturing it in categories and, and linking and different kinds of theories, basically. And uh, <clears throat> there is a gap here, a gap in, in knowledge that we want to address. So this is would be you know, reason for our thesis uh, in a specific area of uh, management, we are interested in looking at how to make people motivated despite them working at distance offices from the headquarter or something like that. And then we look at the theory and say, okay, there are some things that are not already described, already researched. There is not sufficient knowledge in this area. So this is the problematization. We say that this is important because, but there's something missing that we would need. So we need to do research. And then we want to look at the world also to find things out and then come up with this answer that fills the gap in knowledge. And this is a, this is a trip or, or a, like a, a journey uh, into different levels of abstraction where you do different things. So the first thing would be, you know, from this challenge to define some research questions. And that's something you'll all do very early uh, in your uh, thesis proposal or, or whatever. You make this research question. Research questions are pretty hard to do well. And often you need to keep polishing them and, or even reorienting them or shifting them around a little bit once you go into the empirical world, the real world, where you, where you try to describe with data and numbers or quotes, um, and that might might make you need to readjust the research question. But anyway, you start here by translating this challenge into a research question, and then it's good if you, you break that down into sub-questions, right? So, motivation, what could that be? It could be about feeling that you are included, or it could be about how much I'm paid, or it could be that I feel that my work that I'm doing is, is meaningful and so on. So there's lots of different domains here. So I use previous research usually to describe some different aspects of my research question. And that would be sub-questions or sub-areas to look into to answer the whole thing. Uh, and then we can form hypotheses about each of these or several hypotheses uh, if we want to. And if we do that, we usually gather here uh, quantitative data and do statistical verification of our hypotheses. Or we can just make more precise questions and find out <coughs> uh, from interviews and such what is actually happening, how do we explain it, is there some contradictions here that we need to reconcile because in reality, paradoxes don't really exist. So there's uh, something missing in the explanation or the way of thinking about the phenomena. So we go in, we do all our interviews, we uh, take all our notes, do our recordings. Maybe we transcribe uh, into a very thorough documentation, especially if we do a more major thesis. And then we go back here and <clears throat> look what was our hypothesis here? Can we say something about it? Or what was our question? Can we answer it uh, on these low level questions? Right. So then answering all these questions through the analysis would hopefully make us able to draw a conclusion. And the conclusion we can discuss in light of, you know, the uh, theory and the challenge. So okay, what that now will we actually do to be, be able to motivate all employees, not only in our near uh, head office colleagues, but also those that are more further away uh, doing work for us. And that would be 
fitting into what was existing before with the things that we found out here, right? So conclusions, you link, link the theory and, and the findings from the analysis, and then you go back and answer the problem, research question, and uh, contribute something to the world that wasn't there before, right? So it's, it's all nice. Now, the thing is that quality hinges on, on two dimensions here of uh, match or fit. So the first one is between these different parts. So the research challenge should be uh, formulated in the research question in a very strongly, uh, let's say, the research question should be a very concise and specific formulation of the problem that can be answered by finding out things about the world. Right? So it needs to have certain uh, criteria to it and it needs to be very clear that this will actually answer that. Same here, the research question, you need to break that down into sub-questions, but that sh those sub-questions, let's say we have three, they should be mutually exclusive. So you ask about three different things that doesn't overlap or more, or could be two, could be five. Uh, so they should be mutually exclusive, but it should also be collectively exhaustive. So all these three things are the things that actually makes distant office employees motivated. That's all we have, you know. We can still be open in, in our interviews for emergent findings, and, and one conclusion could be that a category is missing, right? But it needs to be completely answered by non-overlapping sub-questions. This can go on also, you know, in more levels. Um, when you do a questionnaire, you have, you know, uh, very specific questions, several under each hypothesis usually. Uh, data gathering is, you know, you do, you do data gathering, you have primary, secondary data and all that, but then you do the analysis, and the analysis should be uh, fed with information on all these aspects that we broke down, and then the conclusion should emerge when you combine the information of the sub-issues into one issue, all right, we'll be able to answer that, hopefully. Or we can say that there is something wrong with the category here, the failure to kill category, because even if we find this out, we have this information, we're still not able to make any conclusion about if uh, the content of work makes them motivated or not. Then maybe we need to refine the theory. And then we go to the discussion. So, Linking between these levels um, is important because when you as a reviewer or an examiner or a, a, even a reader read the thesis, it's very strange when you have a research question and then you have data that is not related here. So you ask about um, well, things that are not connected explicitly to the research question. So let's say we talk about what kind of education do you have uh, and so on. Well, that might be relevant, but then you need to show that it's relevant, right? Um, otherwise, it'd be like a new thing coming in in the middle. And that would raise questions to the reader. Okay, so why is this relevant? Okay, did I miss something? Or do you actually ask, are you actually asking things that answer the problem that we are looking at? This happens because if you do, a, for example, a PG, you go on for a couple of years and there might be some slide in, the, in what you're interested in over time, but you need to then go back and connect it again. Okay, so there's four different contributions you can make here in the discussion. So you can corroborate the existing view that, okay, we looked at another case, we looked at, or we looked at a population and draw some statistics, and we can confirm that it's actually the case that this motivates or do not motivate uh, the people in distance offices. Uh, or you can refute, that means that you show, hmm, okay, it seems that the clear is wrong. We, we found evidence that this is not always the case. Uh, we found that, uh, they are motivated by the content of the work, but not by the rewards, for example. That cannot be supported by this study. 
you can say that the theory is wrong, but you can say that it's not always right. So that's what we usually try to do as professional researchers. We, we try to prove that others are wrong. That's, the, that's how, how it works and how you make a career. That's the best thing you can do. One of the best things you can do. Right, you can uh, corroborate, you can uh, refute, you can refine a theory also. So refining means that these three categories, the, the third one needs to be divided up in several different ones because it's actually the different underlying factors here. Um, we can actually describe it better if we divide up content of work into some, some different model. And uh, then we have refined it and make the uh, knowledge more precise, more highly, more high resolution of categories, so to speak. And then we can extend it. We can say that motivation in the workplace, the, the models for describing motivation in the workplace also works for describing motivation, even, even in distant offices or, you know, in other situations. We extend what's said to apply to more cases or uh, in another context or something. So when you do case-based research, you usually extend uh, generalizability by looking at more companies or industries and so on, rather than saying, with the case that I study, proves that something is a certain way. You can do that with a case study, uh, but you can say, here, it works like this, and then you look, um, look onwards to other uh, context, other situations, and we can find that, okay, here it applies also, or we, maybe with a little twist to build that knowledge uh, by extending. Okay, so, but then there's another dimension. The other dimension is level to level. So when you have a thesis, to read the first thing is that you try to find out what what is it about what's the research question then you look did they answer the research question you go to the back and say okay so they were trying to find out motivation but they talked about uh what is driving influence it doesn't match you answered the wrong question and it's quite common so that's the first thing basically you look for is the research question answered and you should be very clear here so uh, it's on the conclusion level, of course, uh, but if you have a research question, two research questions, it should be very easy to find a little introduction to the conclusions and, you know, the first research question was this, we can answer that now in this way, because we have found in interviews, but also we proved in simulations or observations and so on that this is what actually happens. And then you bring it up to the discussion. Uh, so, you know, make sure that it's easy to find research question in conclusions. Make sure it's easy to find the sub-questions or hypotheses when looking in the analysis. If there's a new thing that's showing up here, doesn't connect here or doesn't connect here, it's going to be tricky. Or if something is suddenly missing here. Okay, they forgot about this. They didn't ask about rewards. All right, but they said in the theory that oh, it's important. Then you're, then you're also having a weak thesis. So basically, uh, the level-to-level -level thinking in the, you know, let's call it the vertical domain, makes you go in the journey down into the real world and find something out and refine that into theoretical knowledge. The consistency or matching here between the different parts make the document as such credible, strong, and concise and well structured. So you will be able to read it and believe it and not get, you know, a lot of surprises about why things are in there and not in there. So that's basically the U model of research, where you go from abstract domain and theory to the real world and back up. Often when we do problem solving, we do the opposite. So we have a problem, we try to think about what is this problem about, what does it mean, what do I know, and then we figure out a solution that might work, and then we try it in the real world. So all learning is a journey between abstract and concrete, but reality and theory. Um, 
and uh, you know it's just different ways to do it. All right, thank you. Let's say in the area when I go to like um, analysis and so on, I discovered that I lost my way, so I discovered that I should have asked about one more specific area that was in my research question. Mm. Let's say the way to catch it up, can I do like more interviews mm. or just those questions cannot be answered in the survey, but if I do interviews, mm. I can go on my, that's the step yeah. away for it. So if, if you're here yeah. and see, all right, I'm not going to be able to match here. Yeah. Something is maybe missing. Well, you have two options. Either you go in and try to get more data. Okay. If you've done a survey, that's almost impossible. Yeah. Because you can't ask the respondents to fill in a few more questions because yeah. you can't link it to their all answers yeah, because they're anonymous. Yeah. Interviews, you can do that. And that's why we always ask if we come back. We come back into that in a moment. Um, Otherwise, you have to say that, right, yeah. yeah, or, you know, we have research, but unfortunately, this third category we will not be able for practical or confidentiality or availability or some reason, we will not cover that, uh, so we just assume something about it or, okay. or not go into it. So you make a limitation after words, right, but, you know, it's... It's uh, not uncommon, but it has to be, I mean, you can always say that you look at a more narrow part of the problem. So you can always, you can always try to, and that, that, that is common, you know, uh, that you go into something and you have two big research question and then you find out, okay, this is something I can answer with this case that I'm looking at and so on. And then you can narrow down the research question because uh, it's very, very common that you have the two wide and big ones in the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So for, we could either have sub-questions or we could have hypothesis over there. Yeah. And for, um, let's say, for a qualitative kind of a research that you're doing, you usually have sub-questions instead yes. of hypothesis. Yes. And, and for, for a quantitative study, you would have hypothesis. Yes. Uh, depends on the type, but you can have an exploratory study, then you might not have too many hypotheses. So if you want to do a survey on motivation, you try to get questions into all these sub-areas, <clears throat> and a couple of questions for each, and then you can do a factor analysis and see what are the main things that drive motivation. And then you, then you look for patterns rather than confirmation of hypotheses. Then you can do hypothesis testing on those, but that will be like a next cycle. Mm -hmm. If you do a PhD thesis or something, you might do that. First, you do the finding factors. So if you have 80 questions, it's nice to categorize that into five, let's say, underlying factors that capture a lot of the variance, and then you can test them in a regression or hypothesis testing and see of these five, which ones are really substantially important uh, to level of a certain significance and so on. So that will be the second chapter in your thesis or second paper. And you'll be like that. Mm -hmm. 